Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Sports Exchange. My name is Scott Morganroth, and I'm joined with my veteran partner, Steve Ballesteri. Glad to have you on the broadcast, Steve. How are you doing? I'm doing just fine, man. I've been looking forward to this all day. So, uh, you know, as always, it's Wednesday night football night. You got it. And before we even kick this bad boy off, you're going to let everybody know Okay, how they get all you? What have you accomplished over the years? We're going to let everybody know every single week. And anybody that ever wants to jo- join the Scott and Steve show has to earn their way on this broadcast. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. And, uh, you know, uh, now that we're doing video, it's kind of nice we get to see each other. So instead of just talking uh, virtually, as everyone says, but at least we can see each other now. And, hey, you know, this is. Uh, it's Wednesday night. We're uh, hump day. You know, we're talking football about what happened on Sunday and what's going to happen this coming week. Well, I don't know. Should I actually title this broadcast called Humble Pie and name it after me about what I did about the Detroit Lions eating I did too. dirt in the desert? I did, too. I, I said they were going to get stomped. And, yeah, but uh, you didn't put a 50 spot on them, though, did you? <laughs> I said they were going to give up 40. So, well, I said 50. So <laughs> I'll take the worst end of the humble pie. You can take part of it, but I'll take a lot of it. Either way, we both didn't look very good on that prediction. But before we go into the games, uh, as always, as customary on the broadcast, Steve, let everybody know what you're about, what you've done in the, with your veterans. I love it when everybody listens to the program, but for an individual that's dealt with the military and the veterans, what you do to me is truly special. So go Please go out there and share it with everybody. Well, thank you. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at SteveB7SFG. Uh, I write for PatsFans.com and cover in the NFL for that. Um, but uh, And I, I do a podcast with us, Patriots 4th and 2. <clears throat> and uh, I also write for SoftRep.com, which is a military-themed website. I, I spent 17 years as a Green Beret in the Army. Um, in fact, uh, this afternoon, I did a long podcast. I don't know if you ever saw Narcos, the show about uh, Pablo Escobar and uh, Colombia, the two uh, DEA agents that were in on the hunt for Pablo Escobar that they based that show Narcos on. I, uh, I did a podcast with the actual guys today, and uh, it was really a lot of fun. I, I was living in Colombia that, during that time period. So, uh, you know, we got to fill in a lot of the blanks of what happened behind the scenes. And they wrote a book, and obviously they based the show off of those two guys' exploits. And, of course, Hollywood took a couple of liberties with it, but, uh, you know, as they always do. But it was a lot of fun. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. No, I can't say I've heard of Pablo Escobar, but then again, for a lot of people that know that when you have been in the sports business 41 years, you know if there's any other life outside of sports. For those <laughs> individuals that tag me that way, you probably begin to wonder anyways. But that doesn't mean that those famous people out there, yours truly probably has missed a great deal of things that I, I shouldn't, but we're trying to become more diversified. So with that said, okay, let's go to the humble pie part of the broadcast. And we're going to talk about the Detroit Lions defeating the Arizona Cardinals out at State Farm Stadium. I guess that's what the new nickname was. It used to be University of Phoenix Stadium, but with all these colleges going broke, they had to name it after an insurance company like they all do. But a field goal decided it with Matt Prater. And the Detroit Lions did a pretty good job, you know, containing Kyler Murray as much as they could. And Kenny Galladay got in there, and Jeff Okuda made a contribution. Yeah, the uh, the Lions – they surprised me on this one. I mean, uh, I, I like I said, <clears throat> I really thought they were, were going to get spanked in this. But, you know, uh, Matt Stafford had a pretty good day, 22-31 uh, for 270 yards and a couple of touchdowns. Adrian Peterson, you know, another 75-yard day. And uh, they got Kenny Galladay back, which was good news for them. And, you know, my man, as you know, I'm a big fan of T.J. Hawkinson. Um, yeah. I thought he had a pretty good day, you know, 53 yards. Um, I think he had four catches, if I'm not mistaken. So right, good right. stuff. And, and as you mentioned, um, you know, the, uh, the Cardinals, you know, uh, they, they kind of, uh, they kept Kyle Murray, you know, uh, under, uh, under wraps a little bit. Right. Um, he had 270 yards. 
and a pair of touchdowns, but he threw three picks. So that was a big, big change for the Lions. Well, the Lions did not go ahead and relinquish a double-digit lead. My goodness. <laughs> Matthew. I know. And that's, uh, you know, and I've been harping on that defense. But, you know, hey, they did a good job of keeping Murray under wraps for the most part. And, you know, they forced three turnovers. And that's uh, that's the kind of thing you need to turn your season around. We'll see if they can, uh, you know, parlay that into just a little bit of momentum this week. Well, you know, I, I always maintain the fact that uh, Matt Prater is one of the best field goal kickers in the game. How many times has this guy kicked for over 50-yard field goals throughout his career? You know who Matt Prater reminds me of? You ever see that movie? And I'm actually talking about a movie for tonight. I must be out of my mind. <laughs> ever heard of that movie, Gus, about the kicking mule? You ever see that movie? No. Oh, you have to go go now. Look at Gus the kicking mule. You know what? I mean, <laughs> It's a G-rated, so for all you people that wonder about Gus the kicking mule, okay, he used to kick field goals. He had a bad offensive team, but he had a mule kicking them right down the middle. In fact, Gus is so accurate, he could have kicked them down an arena football league field right down the middle with those really narrow goal posts. <laughs> I'll have sense. to look that one up. I, I, I'll have to I admit I missed that one. So. <laughs> Don't worry, Steve. If you can't leave this broadcast about me giving you homework about certain things to do, I didn't do my job. <laughs> exactly. Mule and tell me what you think when I grill you on it next Wednesday night. So, I will. So all in all, so we'll go back to the uh, so seriously speaking now. The Lions and the Cardinals. We thought last week, and I and I'd be the first to admit it that when I mess up and I I didn't give the Lions much chance with Matt Patricia's Ben and not break defense, even though it seems to be breaking a lot, that there was a chance that they could have been 0-4. 1-2 and 2 looks a lot better, and they did it on the road. Even though it wasn't a hostile environment because it was empty, they still did it on the road out on the West Coast, which is not an easy task to do. Exactly. And, you know, um, you know, um, one of the things that I always harp on is, you know, when, when a quarterback is struggling and a team is struggling, your best friend is your tight ends. And, you know, in this game, uh, I thought he did a good job. To, speaking of uh, um, Matthew Stafford, you know, I mentioned T.J. Hawkinson. He caught four passes. Jesse James caught three. Um, you know, and uh, hey, that's that's the way to get you know uh, to get the offense moving. And you know, they didn't turn the ball over uh, interception wise. So I, I thought it was a good day for them guys. And uh, it, that's a, to me. That's a big win because the the Cardinals came in on a little bit of a roll. People were starting to believe in them. So, when we talk about T.J. Hawkinson, you obviously been around Rob Gronkowski quite a bit up in New England. Okay, would you say that that's a legitimate comparison when you talk about Hawkinson to Gronkowski, or would you say, Steve, that that's a little premature right now? Yeah, that's premature. But you know, at the same time, you know, that's. Um, I think he can he can become a really, really good tight end in this league. And uh, I don't know if I'd go so far as to compare him to Gronk. You know, I think he's got a long, long way to go before he gets up to there. But, you know, um, the more that I think Stafford trusts him and the more he gets him involved, I think the better it will be. Because they have some good weapons there, yeah. especially now that uh, Galladay's back and Marvin Jones. DeAndre Swift out of the backfield and Danny Amendola, you know, uh, Amendola, the bigger, you know, uh, when he played for New England, the bigger the stakes, the better he played. Okay. Well, that's fair. And now he's a good target for Matt Stafford. I understand that DeAndre Swift had a pretty good catch in that football game too. I think he'll get, he'll get comfortable as time goes on. And I also read today that Adrian Peterson's going to be the lead back for the Lions. That doesn't surprise me at all. This guy, Steve, has a lot in the tank. I really believe that, you know, the Lions, I don't care how old Adrian Peterson is. And if he's in pretty solid shape, get a, and if he can be a safety valve for Matthew Stafford, he can make Stafford a whole lot better than he is and that's what the Lions have lacked is a ground attack yeah exactly and you know the uh the running game is also a quarterback's best friend you know because teams have to play you they have to respect that run and you know when you're running the ball effectively you know they they can't uh 
you know, they can't lay back. And, you know, if they start to cheat up with their linebackers, you can throw it right over the top of them. So, you know, and those, you know, it's a well-known fact. Third and two, third and three are a lot easier to make these days, especially in this day and age with the passing game. Then those third and fives, third and sixes, and, you know, more. So um, that running game, you know, they have carry on Johnson, Adrian Peterson. I mean, hey, uh, Peterson, you know, and you and I talked about this. He, he, him and Frank Gore, I don't know what those guys are putting in their Wheaties, but whatever it is, the rest of us need to be doing the same thing. Those guys don't seem to age as, like everyone else. I don't know. One would think that they're actually going back to the future. Why don't we make all these movie references in one day? Maybe one of these days we'll just get creative and talk about favorite movies like I do with all my good co-hosts. But it looks like to me, Frank Gore and Adrian Peterson are going back to the future because they certainly don't care about back to the past. Exactly. So with that said, we'll go from the State Farm Dome, so to speak, out in Arizona. I don't know what they call it, but the Dome slash No Dome to the Superdome in New Orleans where the Green Bay Packers and the New Orleans Saints played a fine football game. 37 to 30 was the final. We knew going into this game, Steve, that two of the uh, future Hall of Fame quarterbacks and that game definitely lived up to expectation without a doubt. And I'll tell you what, I don't care who you throw Aaron Rodgers' way. He's going to make it work either way. Yeah, and Aaron Rodgers is off to a great start this year. Um, he threw for three touchdowns, no interceptions. Um, you know, uh, and uh, the Packers look pretty good right now. Now, you know, a, a lot of people are already questioning Drew Brees. And, hey, you know, uh, to a degree, I mean, I, I thought he had a really solid game. He threw for almost 300 yards, three touchdowns, no picks. And they're missing, to me, one of the best wide receivers in the game. So, um I, I, I think uh, writing off Drew Brees at this point is a little premature. No question about it. Yeah, I don't have to say much about this game. All I know is the Green Bay Packers played a heck of a football game in the air condition of the Superdome. They didn't need the frozen tundra of Lambeau Field, but they look good. And I'll tell you what, this is a team here that, to me, is a team of destiny. Just because you don't draft a wide receiver in the first round or let alone draft doesn't mean you can't find hidden gems during – free agency, the undrafted free agents. And once upon a time for all those individuals that are tuning in for the first time, Steve and I can remember when this draft was 12 to 18 rounds. So all these other players that are being signed as undrafted free agents, there's some good hidden gems. There really are. And I think that a lot of people should realize that to me, don't panic just because you don't draft a guy. That doesn't mean a guy isn't hungry. That isn't going to make the team because, you know, we both know this, uh, to begin with, you got a 53-man roster, and when you're looking at a sport that has a salary cap, 46 through 53, you're filling out the back end with special team guys and guys that can fill in, let alone the expanded taxi squad. So for those individuals that are panicking about drafting with the Packers, don't. Or I'll go back to what Pete, uh, Aaron Rodgers said, relax. <laughs> exactly. You know, um, there's, there's – uh... There's a long way to go, but they're off to a great start. And, um, you know, if their defense, if their offense obviously is going to be tough to stop. And if their defense continues to play well, this will be one of the teams in the Final Four, I think. Okay. Well, I'm going to, on to the next game, probably the worst kept secret bowl. Okay. After all, they got 9 million bowl games in college. You might have those yeah. left few of them in the pros. And what I mean by the best kept secret bowl is the fact that Chicago Bears beat the Atlanta Falcons, another team that can't stop anybody later. But they did it with a fellow by the name of Nick Foles. My goodness. Mitchell Trubisky done after two and a half games. Nick Foles paid him a boatload of money. Okay, well, we'll call it the Nick. Is it the Nick Foles Bowl or the I Told You So Bowl? I don't know. I mean, we need the NCAA people. Help us out. What kind of a bowl game? Is it the I Told You So Bowl or the Nick Foles Bowl? You tell me. Meanwhile, Nick Foles is the starting quarterback for the Chicago Bears. Nick Foles, and he, let me tell you what, I thought he looked really good. Um, he, he led them back through three touchdowns. He did throw a pick, but he threw three touchdowns, brought them back. He's already been named the starter this coming week. And he lit a fire under the Bears. And we kind of knew this was coming. I mean, you know, it's a, Mitchell Trubisky, I mean, 
we kind of had the feeling they were going to replace him last year and they didn't really, they brought in Foles and, you know, I still think Philadelphia kept the wrong guy, but, uh, you know, we could have a whole nother conversation on that one. They might. <laughs> this is, this wasn't, this is one of those situations. It wasn't a matter of if it was a matter of when. And we knew full well that Mitch Trubisky was under a short leash. And with Matt Nagy as a coach, the guy for whom Foles succeeded, you know, played well under in Kansas City, this was the biggest no-brainer inevitability that I've ever seen. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, I thought uh, I, I thought it was something the Bears needed. And, um, you know, Foles kind of injected some life into that team that was really sorely needed. And Atlanta, once again, I mean, you know, Atlanta's up, what, 20 to 10 in the fourth quarter, excuse me, in the fourth quarter, and then they give up 20 points. It's like, we've seen this movie before, haven't we? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, defensive coordinators that can't stop anybody at the end, Matt, Patricia, Dan Quinn, who did take him to a Super Bowl appearance, but hasn't done a whole lot since that Super Bowl appearance. What is it about these defensive coordinators, though? Steve, that, you know, you, you know, they're, what are they, managing 26 people instead of 53, and they can't focus on their strength on that side of the football? Exactly, and, you know, uh, some of the defenses are so far to share, aren't looking really good. Um, but, you know, I think, uh, I think Dan Quinn is another guy that, I know they gave him a new contract and all that, but uh, I have to think he's on the, his seat's getting warm down there in Atlanta right now because that team does not look good. That that game they blew against Dallas was absolutely. I mean that was awful. I mean you you look at that. All they had to do was fall on the onside kick, and they they sat there and watched it until it went ten yards. And, and then you know now they give up twenty points in the fourth quarter to the Bears. I mean, uh, I think Dan Quinn. His seat's getting warm. Okay, well, I'll tell you what. Let's go to another game. We're going to go through the games. We'll go to like five or six of them. Then we have some really big stuff we want to talk about. Okay, first of all. All right, so let's go on to the Tennessee Titans-Minnesota Vikings. Boy, this was a damaging football game. Let's go first. Tennessee 31, Minnesota 30. The Vikings fall to 0-3. Who would have thought that? Although letting Diggs go didn't help either. But, you know, the Vikings 0-3, this to me is something I never saw coming. Steve. No, I thought the Vikings were going to be a playoff team. And uh, they're not looking like a playoff team right now. They're 0-3, and, you know, uh, I, I have my own reasons not to feel good about this one, and that's <laughs> – I'm, I'm watching uh, Stephen Goskowski kick six field goals uh, for, the, for the Titans, you know, and I'm like, uh, this is a guy the Patriots got rid of. And, you know, their kicking game is kind of shaky. Um, Goskowski was six of six. His long was, I think, 55 or 56 yards in the game. So, um, you know, Tennessee, again, this is a team that's looking really good as well. They're 3-0. and um, I'm still not a big fan of Ryan Tannehill, but he's playing well. Um, and they have that punishing ground game. And, you know, it was just a – I, I thought it was a, a really well, – obviously, it was a close – it was a really good football game. And, um, you know, if somebody was to tell me the Vikings would have been 0-3 at this point, I wouldn't have believed it. Yeah, I would be on the uh, hungover Kool-Aid because I never saw that one coming either. But that's where it is. So, all right, Las Vegas – Loses to New England 36-20. to 20. Don't tell me the New England Patriots weren't mad after losing before. And the Raiders definitely uh, were on the wrong end of a 16-point loss. I hear the game wasn't even as close as it looked. Well, you know, uh, the Raiders actually dominated the first quarter. Um, they were running the ball with Josh Jacobs. And they, they had the Patriots kind of on their heels, although the scoreboard didn't reflect that. It was like three to nothing. Um, you know, and uh, they they kind of dominated, but for some reason, they got away from the running game. And, um, you know, they, they kind of abandoned it a little bit and went, they were trying to throw. And, it, you know, they, uh, they kind of stalled and 
then the Patriots weren't doing anything offensively. Cam Newton didn't have a good game. He, his uh, timing was off. His accuracy was off. He made a couple of bad decisions in the game, threw an interception. Um, and, you know, on the interception that he threw, he had a guy wide open for a touchdown because nobody covered the tight end going down the sideline. Yeah. Uh, he tried to force the ball into a really tight window. And, uh, you know, he, he threw a pick. If he had looked beyond that, there was the tight end nobody was covering. But anyway, um, in the second quarter, the Patriots got their ground game going. And then all of a sudden the floodgates opened and all three backs started really chewing up the uh, the uh, the Raiders. I was about to say Oakland Raiders. I've got to get used to that Las Vegas. Thing. Don't worry, it'll take a while for all of us. Don't feel too bad. So. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, they, they really started chewing up. They ended up with 250 yards on the ground. Um, and, you know, they kind of dominated from that point on. Uh, ten- uh, Tennessee. Uh, Las Vegas scored a touchdown in kind of garbage time with about, you know, three minutes to go. Made it a little bit more respectable. But, um, yeah, by the, you know, midway through the fourth quarter, this one was way over by that point. And mind you, James White wasn't playing either, so you can only imagine what what type of impact. Well, James White didn't play, but Rex Burke had had a tremendous football game. Scored three touchdowns. He had uh, six carries for 49 yards, and he had seven catches for another 49 yards. And he scored uh, three touchdowns, two rushing, one receiving. He had a tremendous football game. And, you know, the, the, the Raiders didn't have an answer for him. And Sony Michelle was running the ball really well. He had nine carries for 117 yards. Um, and then, but what really jump-started, Michelle didn't run well in the early going. And then they went to the rookie, J.J. Taylor, was only 5'6". Taylor kind of lit a fire under the uh, offense and, and got them going a little bit. And then when they brought Sony Michelle back in, he busted off a 38-yard run. And then a little bit later, he busted off a 48-yard run. Right. And then uh, the defense sacked um, their car in the end zone, and they recovered for a touchdown. So, you know, it was a pretty good day for the Patriots' defense. Yeah, well, our, our hearts still go up to James White and his family because of what he went through is just completely tragic. Now, yeah, his, his dad died in a car accident. His, uh, his mom is still, I believe, in critical condition uh, down in Fort Lauderdale. That's too bad. So, in the I told you so category, okay, I don't know if I told you that the Pittsburgh Steelers would be 3-0, and but I can tell you right now that the Houston Texans are 0-3. And Bill O'Brien's giving away everybody, and now he still has a donut, okay? And it's not Krispy Kreme, by the way, that he has. It's an 0-3 record. So, I don't know. The Texans are in trouble, and it's not getting any easier for him. And the longer this downward spiral goes, Bill O'Brien, you know, may find himself in a little bit of trouble if this downward spiral continues, Steve. Yeah, and that's another team I uh, wouldn't have believed it if you had told me. They were going to be 0-3 at this point in the season. Um, you know, they, they have faced a, a tough schedule so far, but, I uh, you know, good teams find ways to win some of these games. And, you know, uh, Bill O'Brien, I mean, yeah, he's won the division, you know, what, three out of the last four years. But uh, I think that they're a more talented team than their record has indicated. You know, they've been winning the division at nine and seven, 10 and six kind of thing. And I think his seat's getting warmed on in Texas right now because that's not an 0 and 3. They shouldn't be 0 and 3. There's no reason for it. And, you know, um, the Steelers are looking really good right now. And, and that defense is playing outstanding football. Right. Well, let's face the reality. When you give away DeAndre Hopkins and you keep trading away every player on the planet, don't you think that that seat's going to get warmer quickly? It's one thing to be able, Steve, to go out there and coach, but sometimes when you have more than one responsibility, whether it's personnel, whether it's coaching, I think that's a lot for one individual to bite bite off. And I still think the DeAndre Hopkins trade is one of the worst trades that he can make for whatever reason he tries to justify it. And right now, it's showing in the standings, Steve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I still don't know what possessed them to do that because 
you know, now they're 0-3. And, and the Cardinals are, you know, uh, they were a, a hair away from going 3-0. and So things are definitely trending the wrong way for Houston and Bill O'Brien. And, um, you know, they – they have a tough road to hold around to, to make it to the playoffs. All right. Uh, two more games I want to get to. Apparently the Seattle Seahawks had enough Starbucks because they uh, had enough caffeine to beat the Dallas Cowboys 38 to 31 premier matchup. You had Russell, you had Russell Wilson against Dak Prescott. What are your thoughts about that game? That was a really good football game. And, you know, um, you know, the Cowboys had to lead the late and, Russell Wilson is just, he's playing like a magician these days. You know, uh, I thought he was outstanding once again. And then Prescott had a chance late in the game to bring the Cowboys back. They actually got within range. And I thought Jerry Jones threw his quarterback under the bus. I I don't know if you saw his comments after the game. I was a little shocked by it, you know, because he was basically saying, well, you know, Russell Wilson – you know, got a big payday, and he makes these plays all the time. And, you know, uh, our guy didn't. And I, it's, uh, I think you yeah, have a hard time justifying that loss on Dak Prescott. Yeah, but Jerry Jones is looking for a way to deval- use this in contract negotiations. I know the psychology that Jerry's trying to use. Oh, of course. Build yourself a big play plan and uh, be a billionaire for nothing. So he's probably telling Dak, you should have gotten the money when I offered it to you during (laughs) COVID-19. And not to say that they won't work on an agreement unless Jerry isn't totally sold on Dak. But, you know, bear in mind, this is, we're not talking about soap operas like the edge of night. Okay. General hospital, one life to live. We're talking about the Dallas Cowboys, AKA America's team, which I never bought in that America's team business anyways, but as the Jerry world turns, I guess we'll come up with a new soap opera that probably hasn't already come. So don't worry. The caffeine isn't that bad tonight for me. Those are just the one-liners coming off and rapid fire. All right. With, with, with that said, okay, we'll go on to the Kansas City Chiefs and the Baltimore Ravens, okay? Oh, uh, man. We have an Indian beating up on a bird. wonder how <laughs> that one sounds in the old analytics of logic and philosophy. I don't know if I want to go that far because I'll have all the Indians taking shots at me and they'll probably run me off the air. But anyways, what are your observations about what happened out in the, by the inner harbor with the Chiefs? I think the Ravens kind of poked the bear a little too much this week. Um, you know, I, I thought Kansas City, they, they came into the game 2-0. and but I thought they kind of slept, walked their way through those two games. I mean, they won both of them, absolutely. Patrick Mahomes brought them back against the Chargers. But they didn't look unbeatable, especially against the Chargers. I, that, that was a game they could have easily have lost. And, you know, then the Ravens started making a lot of noise, as they always do. I mean, that's that's their M.O. And, you know, they were talking about, well, we, we're the team that should have been there. And, we're going to show them. And I thought it was like, you know, <laughs> this is a team that won the Super Bowl. And I think they poked a bear a little too much because I thought they were absolutely eviscerated by Patrick Mahomes, especially that first half. That came within two inches of being 34 to 10 at the half because uh, right before the half, remember Mahomes – had a, a player wide open down in the end zone, and it just went off his fingertips. I think if that ball was maybe two or three inches uh, closer, it's 34 to 10 at the half, and then the kicker ended up missing the field goal. But I thought Mahomes just tore them apart. And then their defense was very aggressive. They uh, they bottled up Lamar Jackson, and that's the the one knock on the Ravens. They – if they get ahead with that running game and that punishing running game, they can wear teams down and then their passing game is there. But they're, that's not a team that's built to play from behind. Well, as you being a New England guy would say, who's your daddy? I guess Pedro Martinez made that decision when he couldn't beat the Yankees. And I'm wondering if we use a Pedro Martinez saying, okay, who's your daddy? Knowing that the Kansas City Chiefs seem to have the Baltimore Ravens number. What, are, would you agree with that assessment about Pedro Martinez? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And and with the uh, with the Chiefs, I think, you know, 
the Chiefs are a bad matchup for the Ravens. And, um, you know, if they meet again in the playoffs, I, um, you know, I actually picked Baltimore uh, because I thought the Chiefs hadn't really played, you know, a, a, a real a, a full 60-minute kind of Chiefs game that, you know, we saw last year. So I thought, well, in the early going, I think Baltimore might take this one at home. Uh, but I, I'll tell you what, if they meet in the playoffs, the the Ravens are going to be hard pressed to stop that offense because uh, they just have so much speed in that air raid type of offense. They spread everybody out. They have four guys running deep, and there's just speed all over the field. And then they use those guys who do those deep crossers, and it's almost impossible to stop. Well, if they meet in the playoffs, they're probably going to meet over at Arrowhead Stadium. Fans or no fans. The Kansas City Chiefs are awfully good at Arrowhead Stadium. I don't care. I've actually seen it there many, many years ago when there were fans. And I'll tell you what, everybody talks about how loud things can be over in Seattle. But go out there and see a game over at Arrowhead and tell me that the earplugs won't be in your ears because they will be for sure. All right, so let's go on to uh, some games this week. And then I want to bring up something that Gil Brandt brought up earlier that I saw on Twitter. Okay, we'll talk about the New Orleans Saints and the Detroit Lions. No, I'm not going to beat up in the Lions this bad. No, this game is at Ford Field. And if Matthew Stafford and the rest of that gang can go ahead and play as good a game as they did in Arizona, I'll give the Lions a puncher's chance to win this football game if they can show some balance on offense and do a capable job on defense. Where do you see, Steve, okay, the New Orleans Saints and the Detroit Lions game looking uh, this week over at Ford Field? Yeah, and again, I think you hit the nail on the head. They they have a puncher's chance in this one. They're playing at home. The, but the, the guy they got to stop is Alvin Kamara. Right. This guy's having a tremendous year. And without Michael Thomas there, I mean, he's their go-to guy. And, you know, if, if they – I'm not saying stop him because uh, – I don't know whether anyone would actually stop him per se, but if they can slow him down enough, I think they have a, they have a shot. Um, I still like the saints in this one. I think Drew Brees is, I think, you know, uh, reports of his demise are a little premature. Uh, and as long as Kamara is still on the field playing the way he is, that that's a tough uh, offense to stop. Yeah. You know what? I don't know if I'm drinking the, Arizona Kool-Aid on this that I threw my hometown team under the bus. And again, everybody's had a reason for the last 60 some odd years to do it. But for some crazy reason, I don't even know why I must be out of my mind. I'm going to give the Lions a 27-24 win in this game. And if I'm right, they're two and two. If I'm wrong, Matt Patricia is closer to the door. So <laughs> yeah. and we'll see what the Lions well, if, if they beat the Saints, then what? that seat of his just cooled off quite a bit. Well, they'd be two and two. And not that I'm a real math genius. I leave the math business to Fred Ebling, my father-in-law, who probably listens to these broadcasts. But the difference between one and three and two and two is a digit, a straight line, okay, as in one win, going north and south. But that said, okay, you know, I applied for him, not upset at all that I didn't get approved for the Seattle Seahawks and the Miami Dolphins. Maybe my only chance of getting a Dolphins pass is if the Dolphins are bad. I don't care. I'm not worried about it during a full year. I expect to go to those fish games. But meanwhile, Seattle is coming to the East Coast to take on the Miami Dolphins. Will the Dolphins be competitive, or will they be closer to two of time here in South Florida? I think they'll be competitive because, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the Seahawks defense has been struggling a bit. Well, they've been struggling quite a bit. And so I think that Ryan Fitzpatrick will be able to find some holes. They're going to move the ball. They're going to score some points. Whether or not they can stop Russell Wilson from scoring pretty much at will, I think that's going to be the big one. You know, they, they need a extraordinary game out of their defense this week. And no one seemed to be able to stop Wilson yet. So I, I like my uh, – I excuse me, I like Seattle in this one. But I think Miami will keep it – they'll keep it competitive. I, I think Fitzpatrick is, is playing loose. He's playing with house money. He knows he's not the long-term guy here. And he's just going out there having fun. And, you know, it, it's I, – I think he's playing 
he's playing with a lot of confidence, really. And, um, you know, uh, I know that the players all um, really respect him. After the game the other last week, I was really surprised to see, you know, one of the running backs, uh, I think it was Gaskin, say that the players on offense all rushed to the meeting room during the week so they could sit next to Fitzy. That says a lot. And they've had 10 days to prepare for uh, Seattle. So uh, we'll see what Brian Flores can concoct here. But I still like Seattle in this one. Well, I'll make sure to get all the transcripts so you know exactly what Brian Thank Flores you. is saying. So, yeah, yeah, I'll go 37-21 in favor of the Seahawks. I will. Uh, Russell Wilson seems to be scoring 35 points plus every game. The only thing they can only hope for that DK Metcalf doesn't hot dog his way to the end zone like he did before. <laughs> Although he didn't make that game winning catch at the end. But that really yeah, that was a great catch. And he made up for his blunder there earlier in the game. That That's a learning point that I don't think he'll make that mistake again anytime soon. That had Leon Lett written all over it, didn't it? Oh, man. My goodness, how you and I can give a history lesson to those individuals that are watching this educational broadcast that we still enjoy <laughs> every single week. But that said, we're going to go back to your uh, team, the New England Patriots, and they get the Kansas City Chiefs at Arrowhead Stadium. All right, yeah. you know more about it than I do. Talk to educate everybody about what the Patriots' chances are against the Kansas City Chiefs. Well, I think that uh, the Patriots have done a, a fairly – fairly good job of slowing down uh, Patrick Mahomes when they faced him. Uh, they held him to 23 points last year. Um, but that being said, I mean, their their linebacking core is depleted this year. So it's going to be difficult. Now, the one thing the Patriots can do is, and the only way to really play this, this uh, Chiefs offense is you have to, play man up you have to be physical with them at the line and now that being said you know when you when you're playing that type of defense you can give up the big play if one of those guys breaks free you know you're going to give up that big play but they can live with that because they've everyone has seen and the Patriots have tried it they tried playing zone and when you play zone against Patrick Mahomes he's going to eat you alive because you can't give those speedy receivers, any kind of, uh, you know, free release. Because if you give them a free release, they're gone. You won't cover them. So, you know, the Patriots have the personnel to do that. But, you know, keeping Pat Mahomes under wraps for an entire game, as we've seen, that's not an easy task. So then it falls upon your offense. You have to control the ball and you have to score. It can't be – we talked about this on a podcast this afternoon. You can't have any field goals. When you get the ball, you have to control it four or five minutes down the field, and you have to score six. You start kicking field goals, that's a recipe for having a long face and a long plane ride home. Yeah, no question about it. And in the case with the Patriots, as you alluded to throughout this broadcast and the other ones leading up to it, you know what, you better throw that ball to all your running backs and be able to – go out there and get Amendola. I don't care whether you run the football or not, you throw the ball to your running backs. It's about keep. It's about winning the time of possession battle. And with me covering the Lions for many, many years, the only way that Barry Sanders ever got stopped in Chicago one time was when the, the Chicago Bears had dominated time of possession with 40 minutes and Barry Sanders couldn't get on the field. If Barry Sanders got on the field, he'd run and he'd run amok. But so whether you're throwing the ball, you know, obviously, like you said, Julian Edelman has been a target that Cam Newton has grabbed to right away. And you can throw to all your running backs at every target on the planet. You've got to maintain time possession or you're in trouble, especially against a prolific offense like the Kansas City Chiefs for sure. So but I like the Kansas City Chiefs uh, owning the. I, I could see them winning by double digits. I'm not going to get too crazy with the score. but double nope. I, I think it's – yeah, I think they're going to win comfortably this week. Yeah. Because the, those – like I said, the the linebacker core is depleted. They can, The Chiefs can run the ball now. And so, you know, the Patriots will kind of dare them to run, and they'll be willing to give up that five and six yards without, you know, by going to those lighter packages. Um, I think Bill Belichick has shown that 
he's willing to do that if it keeps the Chiefs from airing the ball out down the field. But uh, I just don't think the offense will be able to keep up this week. Um, hopefully, James White did return to practice today, which is a good sign. Um, and Damian Harris, who everyone up here was really excited about, um, well, I should say up there, not up here anymore. Um, uh, you know, he had a great preseason or training camp, I should say. And, um, you know, a lot of people had him taking Sony Michelle's job away from him. Then he broke his pinky right before the first game of the year. So he spent the first three games on IR. Uh, he's back at practice now as well. Very good. Okay, well, so let's go on to the something's got to give bowl. Call it the winless bowl. I can't wait to play around with this stat for the rest of this broadcast, but I got a lot of good stuff. The Minnesota Vikings take on the Houston Texans, the 0-3 bowl. My goodness, who would have thought that a matchup with Deshaun Watson and Kirk Cousins would uh, were the two quarterbacks would be 0-6 combined with Mike Zimmer as your coach and Bill O'Brien. This one certainly didn't look like both would be 0-6, but nevertheless, the 0-3 bowl takes place out in Houston. Yeah, I'm, I've been going back and forth with this one since I saw it on the schedule this week. I think I'm going to go with the Texans on this one. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm thinking at home, I think uh, they, they're going to get a fire lit under them, even though, again, there's not going to be any people there. But I think, you know, being at home, I think, you know, we'll, we'll get a, a big game out of their defense this week. Uh, maybe J.J. Watt will make something happen. Um, and then I, I, I like Deshaun Watson. I really do. I still don't know why they traded Nuke. I, I don't get it. I you know, that, I, I think that might be the difference for them being, you know, 0-3 and, and possibly 3-0. and 0. Well, to be honest with you, I think solving the Rubik's Cube would be a lot easier than trying to figure out why they go out there and trade a DeAndre Hopkins. Yeah. Do you have a Rubik's Cube at, at home? <laughs> I do not. Well, I don't know. When we get out to uh, your neck of the woods, maybe both of us can go out there after we have our cheese curds over at Culver's and find Rubik's Cube and try to figure out half these moves that made in the NFL. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not smart enough to go figure it out, so I don't know. Go figure. But, yeah, you know what, Steve? I'm going to go with Houston, Deshaun Watson. I like David Johnson, and they might have some decent – but I think Minnesota's got a lot of problems. I really do. Yeah, the same here. I, I like Houston in that one. So we go from one 0-3 matchup to a Thursday night version of it. My goodness, the Denver Broncos, although uh, against the New York Jets, Drew Locke got hurt, Jeff Driscoll, no good. I believe he got, is it Brett Rippon? Uh, Mark Rippon's, I think, nephew or relative of his, taking on Sam Darnold. And this one's over in the Big Apple. My goodness, another 0-3 game. That means two ga- t- games are 0 0- and three uh <coughs> and and we have one on thursday night you talk about the thursday night stinker the denver broncos and new york jets one three for uh my wife's uh boss john paul don't take this personally my friend but i don't know how the heck the denver broncos are on prime time against the new york jets so john paul if for some reason you're listening to it I'm, you know, God bless my friend, but this is not the Denver Broncos and the New York Jets is a bad look on Thursday night. Oh, this is this is one of those stinkeroos, and and again, a lot of people thought Denver was going to make a, a an improvement this year. It definitely hasn't looked that way. And then I saw in the New York Post the other morning that if the Jets lose on Thursday, that Adam Gase is gone. Apparently, there's a lot of dissension in the locker room. Um, they're just playing terrible football, and they're not a good football team anyway. I, I think that's one of the weakest rosters in the NFL, if not the weakest. Um, as much as uh, it pains me to say it, but going on the road on a Thursday night, I think Denver wins this one. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll stick with you on this. I really do. Right now, the, there's been tension with Adam Gates. First of all, he left Miami. And I was surprised he got a job right away. That's item number one. Everybody thought that he was the answer to help get Ryan Tannehill straight. Now, the only thing that got Ryan Tannehill straight now was taking the first bus out of Miami <laughs> or situation in Tennessee, which was a whole lot more desirable. 
Now, don't kid yourself. South Beach is a great place for tourism. Music City isn't a bad alternative either. But no, it isn't. That's a great place, isn't it? Well, I have family there, so I have the luxury of hanging out with them when we get a chance. So I love Music City. Of course, I love being in South Florida, too. But Adam Gase, to me, if he gets ousted here with the Jets, he doesn't land anyplace else. His next job is an offensive coordinator because he hasn't been able to cut it as a head coach. I understand Denver's difficulty. Drew Locke was their quarterback going in. Anytime your starting quarterback goes down, then, you know, we've seen that as a recipe for disaster. We saw what happened last year when Matthew Stafford went down, and who did they go turn to? Jeff Driscoll. Well, don't worry, Jeff, you're not – the problem in both demises because you had Matthew Stafford that you replaced and then David Blau went in and they still never got any wins. So I can be a little more sympathetic for the Broncos side. It really can when your franchise quarterback goes down to an injury, but this doesn't look good for Adam Gase. So when I call it the Adam Gase pool, you know, everybody in Denver will look at him. Well, at least he was a guy that worked with Peyton Manning. That's great. Peyton Manning helped you get a head coaching job. You weren't able to keep it. So I'm going with Denver in this game. So, John, Paul, if you are ever listening, at least you'll get off the stein and at least get a win under your belt so you go one and three. Yeah, okay. and, you know, looking at that game, I mean, again, by, you know, I don't know how accurate their sources are from the post, but if, if they're already thinking about cutting Adam Gase loose, that tells you he's lost the locker room because this early juncture, if, if if a team is getting ready to ditch a coach, that means the players have tuned him out. And uh, uh, I think that that's not a good sign this early in the season. Well, I you know, if, you're, if you're six, seven weeks in and you're, you know, winless and the players are tuning you out, then, yeah, I get that. But only three games in, that's not a good sign. Well, Adam Gates not getting along with Le'Veon Bell's not helping. And if he gets embarrassed on national TV, that's a recipe for a disaster. So we've got two strikes going for him as well. So I'm with you. That is definitely a recipe for disaster. But that said, okay, you know, we talk about two teams that are 0-3. The Cincinnati Bengals are 0-2-1. At least they got a salvage to tie with the Philadelphia Eagles. And I still think that Joe Burrow is certainly on the upside. So here's a little tidbit that I should point out. According to Gil Brandt, and I had the good fortune of meeting Gil, I believe uh, when the Super Bowl was here, when the Indianapolis Colts took on New Orleans, and I had a chance to meet him over at the Fort Lauderdale Convention Center. But get this, Steve, since 1978, okay, 193 teams have started an NFL season 0-3, not including the six this year. Only five have made the playoffs. Now, here are the teams, Steve, okay, in 1981, the New York Jets were 10-5-1. 1992, the San Diego Chargers. And, yes, they were the San Diego Chargers. We couldn't get this one wrong if we tried to. They were 11-5. And, and the 1995 Detroit Lions, which I happened to be covering at the time, they ended the season, I think, on an uh, eight-game winning streak, only to get blown out by Philadelphia. They were 10-6. 1998 Buffalo Bills were 10-6. And, and the 2018 Houston Texans were 11-5. But think about it, Steve. Only five teams out of 193 have made the playoffs. And, and again, we're talking about the Cincinnati Bengals who are 0-2-1. Boy, that's trouble, man. <laughs> yeah, I, especially in that division. So, you know, I'm not looking for the, uh, the Bengals to make any kind of push anyway. Right. I mean, with the Ravens and, you know, the Steelers, uh, that's – they're not going to make the playoffs. Uh but I do like the way Joe Burrows has been playing. And, you know, I, I thought they had a legitimate shot at pulling that game off on Sunday against the Eagles. I thought they should have won it, but they couldn't hold on and they ended up with a tie. But um, I think they have to be pleased. Uh, again, I'm not a big fan of throwing the uh, rookie quarterbacks into the mix this early because a lot of times you can ruin their confidence. But he seems to be playing real well. Well, he came from LSU, he had to tip on his shoulder at Ohio State. So, you know, he comes from a football family. So if you think there's anybody that can handle it, it's Joe Burrow. But I think the thing that surprises me so much about that, Steve, is you have six teams that are 0-3, and yet another one is winless. Okay, 0-2-1. But I like the 0-2-1 because I think the Bengals have potential there. 
But of those six teams, two of them were thought to be contenders with Houston and Minnesota drinking the uh, downslide Kool-Aid. I love mentioning Kool-Aid today because there seems to be a lot of that drink going around here with a lot of the things that we talked about so far. Yep. Um, you know, it's it's a weird season. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> this whole year has been crazy, you know, with the COVID-19 and then the Tennessee Titans, you know, uh, it broke that their game with Pittsburgh is postponed, you know, because of the the COVID and they have, what was it, eight guys, uh, right. three players and five uh, front office people, you know, have come up positive. So, you know, it's it's a weird year. And I think some teams have handled it much better. Mm-hmm. And um you know, with veteran teams who've been together longer, you would think with coaches like a, you know, Minnesota, like a Houston, you would have assumed that they would have handled this better. And it doesn't seem like it, does it? Yeah, let's go. With that point. I'm glad you brought that up. So we're going to go into it further. The Tennessee Titans Pittsburgh Steelers game had been postponed following the virus test. Uh, so they're talking about a Monday, Tuesday, and Mike Vrabel said that uh, there's really nobody to blame. And you know what? For some reason or another, Steve, I actually believe him because, you know, we all thought at some point the NFL would run into this problem. Well, they've handled it quite well so far. This is a virus that you got to take seriously. And if they've been able to get at least three weeks in, I think they're doing a pretty good job. But I do believe that Mike Vrabel's right. You know, there's nobody to blame for it right now. There really isn't. You know, this virus here, hit Major League Baseball, the only two sports that have really handled it brilliantly. The NHL has crowned a champion, the Tampa Bay Lightning. Congratulations to the Lightning. And, of course, the NBA is about to crown one with the Miami Heat taking on the L.A. Lakers uh, as we speak tonight. So, you know, the NFL has handled it well. So do you agree with Mike Vrabel that right now up to this point nobody is to blame? With the- yeah, I, I mean, unless something comes out that they were blatantly not following the procedures. I mean, uh, you, the, I read this afternoon that, you know, their linebacker coach came down with a positive test on Saturday. And, you know, Vrabel uh, didn't bring him to the football game. They immediately quarantined him. But, you know, none of the other people had tested positive at that point. Right. So, you know, who knows where, you know, the – the contamination, I guess you could say, um, you know, where where the, the sickness came from. So it could have come from anywhere. And, you know, the, they'll, uh, they'll keep up with what's going on. I, I think we knew that this was going to happen sooner or later. And no, I, I, I can't, I'm not blaming anyone. I mean, if it comes out later on that the Titans weren't following the procedures the way the league said, then yeah, I, I would hold their, their feet to the fire with this. And I would find them heavily for that, but there seems to be none of that. Okay, well, I got a couple other points that we're going to get to. Uh, that being the NFL is threatening now to strip draft picks if coaches don't follow uh, mass protocols. Well, you know what? You're not going to nail them in the pocketbook. These guys are millionaires. So you want to really get a team badly? Well, take away their draft choices of capital. How many undrafted free agents you going to have out there? You need the draft picks. If the coaches don't care about it in the wallet, take away the picks. How many times? Oh, that, that? That'll get their attention, oh, won't it? Yeah. I would yeah. think. Yeah. Yeah, and they have to follow the protocol. I mean, if the coaches aren't following it, the players aren't going to. You know, and I don't have a problem with when, you know, a coach pulls down the mask and calls in to play on the microphone. Right. I, I don't have a problem with that. But then, you know, and I understand sometimes in the heat of the, the moment, the game, you know, he's watching the play and he forgets to pull it back up. Um, again, I'm not going to fault a coach for that. If if they just leave it down for the entire game. Right. Yeah. Then they should be fine. And maybe take a draft pick. That will get people's attention to or at least if a coach starts to do that, just out of – absent-mindedness, one of his staff will come up and tell him to put the mask on. Yeah, I mean, we're crying out loud. I mean, you know what? Money doesn't get the job done. Draft choice as well. Yeah, I agree with you, Steve. You know, 
if you're on there talking into the microphone and you call the play, put the mask back on. Don't get caught on camera these days where everybody's looking at you anyways. It's not like the old days where the camera wasn't on you. Although I got to tell you a funny story. Remember years ago when quarterbacks used to get into arguments with their coaches? I can remember any time when Jeff George would get in an argument with June Jones. And I remember, uh, I remember, I think Gary Danielson once got in an argument with Tommy Hudspeth. We're like going back a few years now on national TV and these things that got on. If you get caught on camera, you get caught with your hand in the cookie jar. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, Phil Sims and um, Bill Parcells. Oh, you know, they used to do it too. So yeah. but the camera. And I, you know, I always admired Sims for that because Parcells was uh, one of those no nonsense guys and, you know, he would shout people down, and Sims used to give it right back to him. Well, you know, you know where Phil Sims played his college ball, don't you? No, I don't remember. Moorhead State. Moorhead State. <laughs> well, I feel well, it's a good one. Times Ballastery, Moorhead State. Don't worry, Jeff Perlman got it a whole lot worse on our earlier edition on the Sports Exchange. I got to tell you a couple of interesting uh, tidbits about that. When he asked me. Uh, who the Blue Hens were, I told them the Delaware Blue Hens. Really? You got that one, right? So yeah, I visited the Delaware campus. So then I told him about the Delaware State Hornets. He was impressed. So when he asked me where Utah State, uh, where Eric Hippel played his ball, I said, oh, they played at Utah State. Now all of a sudden I've got Jeff Perlman's attention. Like this guy thinks he knows what he's talking about. And he does. <laughs> so I'm not trying to brag a little bit. But I, what good would a broadcast be if I can't give you a little bit of homework to do a little bit of Google when you talk about Moorhead State and Gus the Kicking Mule? Yeah, I, I have to look that one up. Uh, you know, the Kicking Mule <laughs> is definitely on my must-watch list this week. Oh, come on. What would a broadcast be without us two KG veterans without a homework assignment here and there, right? <laughs> if you're looking for a G-rated movie, Steve, and you got a little time with all that retirement – and between the broadcast, the writing, watch Gus the Kicking Mule. Then you might see a lot more of Matt Praters around and all these good kickers. That, hey, listen, you know what? The closest thing that ever came to a Kicking Mule to me was when Tom Dempsey had that square foot and used to kick him straight. 63-yarder against the was That was against the Lions. The Tulane Stadium. Yeah. Why our Detroit Lions are always on the wrong side of it. <laughs> the Tulane Stadium. The only way to kick him straight is if you have a square foot. Rest in peace, Tom. But you know what? We're talking about kicking about kicking mules on this edition of the Sports Exchange. Sports Exchange. My name is Scott Morgan Rock, along with Steve Ballastere. We do this every Wednesday night. We talk football. We talk history. We talk anything that comes to mind. Don't worry about it. I feel like I'm a Starbucks guy waiting to happen. Don't worry about all the caffeine that I may or may not have. You know what? When you're in the Motor City Mad Mouth and you're rambling off one-liners faster than the automobile companies can make cars that means steve and i have a whole lot of fun and anybody that comes into our playpen better be prepared to take what we got to offer with that said let's talk about the Las vegas raiders are investigating after players were seen without a mask at an indoor charity event oh i love charity events but boy we don't like them when you don't follow the protocol out there the biggest hashtag on the planet mask up but they weren't doing it they thought they were at a masquerade party bad analogy mask up raiders uh-uh i don't care if you're in las vegas or not may oj simpson won't hide in vegas and you're not going to get noticed without a mask don't worry oj nothing against you my friend you still gave me one of my greatest interviews when i was a pup growing up go ahead what are your oh, thoughts real, really yeah oh yeah no i let me not i'm thinking about it we're talking about a monday night football game when i was a pup okay covering the miami dolphins at the orange bowl and i couldn't get howard cosell to talk to me then again i hear he was a jerk anyway so i had to settle on mr hertz oj simpson and oj simpson said that's a pretty good interview boy forget about nicole brown or richard goldman or ronald goldman whatever it's a goldman uh but anyways oj was really nice to me and uh it was one of my better interviews growing up as a kid but uh going back to my point okay oj wherever you're at hope you're enjoying life but that was a great interview but for those individuals you can't go out there and hide in las vegas since you guys are the new game in town and you're going to get noticed at a lot of places yeah, and uh, yeah, the, if, if the uh, Raiders players didn't wear a mask or, again, forgot them at a charity event, then the event should have some on hand say, hey, you know, 
you need to do this because there's obviously going to be people watching. Right. And whenever NFL team does a charity event, there's always somebody from the media there because they're, they're trying to trump up the, uh, excuse that pun there. They're trying to uh, report good, uh, you know, good stuff coming out of the league. Oh, I, so, I kind of like the Trump pun. I thought it was very appropriate. <laughs> Not any politics on this broadcast, but I think it was. You and I, again, we're a dearth of one-liners. It doesn't make any difference. But, yeah, you can't get caught without a mask. Why do you think everybody's saying mask up out there? Do we think that this virus is going to get any easier? No. Do I think a round two is going to happen sooner enough? Yes. Okay. I really do believe that in my mind. Mask up, Raiders. You know, I think what's amazing, though, Steve, is when you think about Sean Payton having the uh, coronavirus and John Gruden, don't you think that these guys would be good examples to these players? Hey, I had it. This thing hurts. It's, it's, it stinks. But yet they're still making mistakes. And yet you're a franchise. You know, Mark Davis has got to be telling his guy, hey, I'm, this is a brand new franchise in this market. We don't need any embarrassing public issues like this. I realize it's a fun time, but we don't need to take it to that extreme where it makes us look bad. And the last thing the Raiders need to be doing now is missing any games because I don't know where there's a lot of room to continue to have these games unless you plan to play them in the middle of the week because I have a feeling that you may be seeing Monday and Tuesday night football or Wednesday night football at the rate we're going. I don't know how else you reschedule these things. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, they're talking Monday or Tuesday for – you know, the Titans and the Steelers, and we'll, we'll have to see how that plays out. But, yeah, the players got to follow the protocol because, you know, you, you're dealing – you're not dealing with a couple of people. You're dealing with 53 players. Then you got all your coaches and your front half office staff and the training staff. And, I mean, there's, there's a lot of people every week involved with this. So they have to do it. There's no excuse not to. And don't forget your taxi squad, too. You have, what, 16 people on the taxi squad as well. you got practice players. So everybody better be careful. This isn't the type of virus that you take lightly. If you do, you know, it's, it can kill you. They really can. You know, I, I know that we keep saying it. We may be a broken record, Steve. I don't apologize for us being a broken record, reinforcing the obvious message that needs to be out there because evidently nobody's really getting it. And I don't, I'm not really comfortable that our state of Florida is on – Phase three, I, I think that's a little premature. I really do. I know you haven't been here long enough, but I think you're well aware that we're in a state here where, you know, I that's heavily dependent on tourism. I get that. I mean, we'll accept it. I'll still continue to do the conservative things I need to do. But guys, take this corona thing seriously, guys and gals, because it is dangerous. Nobody is out of the woods yet. No, not at all. And, you know, that that's a big thing. I mean, uh, you know, down here in, in Southwest Florida, you know, everyone's supposed to be wearing masks in uh, shopping malls and the stores and all that. And I'd say at least a third of them aren't. Right. Well, you know what I've learned, and my wife and I really practice this quite a bit, is when we go to restaurants, Steve, we, what we like to do is we like to go when they first open up. There's no people there anyhow. I'm going to go ahead and have my splurge. I'll do it right out of the no people or less people and then I could burn my calories off a little earlier. That doesn't hurt any either. When we go to places like Walmart, we like to get there right when it opens up early in the morning, get in, get out. And besides I can get on my diet Mountain Dew before everybody steals it by the end of the day. <laughs> if that didn't get enough, I'll wipe out the diet Pepsi or the diet Coke. So yeah. uh, I like to get to these crowded places really early because you know what? I don't know how comfortable I am going to feel for, for a while, Steve. I really don't. I don't know about you, but, to me, just it's a lot easier to play it safe than it is to deal with the uh, face of music, going to the hospital and deal with medical bills and put your loved ones in a very tough situation that could completely be averted. So is there anything else you want to add on tonight's broadcast, Steve, that uh, I may have overlooked? Well, I think, you know, uh, it was a very interesting week. We don't have the greatest of uh, Thursday night games, as you said, to kick this week off, but I, I think Sunday slate is going to be intriguing. I think we're, we have some great football coming up, and we're we're already at the quarter mark of the season. And, yeah. You know, Sunday will be the quarter mark. Yeah. Hard to believe. And I'll be watching it in a sports bar. My wife's game is on Monday night, so all I, all I have to do is go uh, get the early game out of the way. So, hey, I, at some point I'll be covering NFL games full-time. I realize the one thing that we have to deal with nowadays 
is the fact that the press box is uh, much further below capacity. And I get it. I have no problem with it at all. You know, and when the time comes and it's safe, though, let me tell you, we both know that PR staffs want those press boxes full. They really, really do. But by the same token, the NFL mandates these changes. And I think a lot of them are out of the uh, control. So, you know, I enjoy all the information that the Miami Dolphins, the Jacksonville Jaguars, and the Detroit Lions send us. I always feel like we can stay ahead of things with all the information, and we're very grateful for what they do so that I can forward it on to the people that really need it. So, no, God bless all the organizations. They're trying really hard. And, you know, we just have to make the best of a very difficult situation. That's what we have to do, and and that's exactly what we're going to do week in and week out. All I know is there are some things I enjoy doing. I enjoy doing 8 to 10, 12 broadcasts, whatever I can crank out every week because I believe that everything we do when I surround myself with the best people on the planet makes all the difference and it makes what we do a whole lot more fun. So, you know, I appreciate everything we do together and, hey, we got a lot more to do. So I like to fire everybody up. So before we close out the broadcast, uh, since we're talking about Thursday night games, what were your thoughts about the Miami Dolphins-Jacksonville Jaguars game last Thursday night? I thought it was a great game. Um, yeah. uh, I thought Fitzpatrick, I mean, you know, and you and I have talked about it on this show. He's very streaky. And when he gets on one of those hot streaks, he, he's, <laughs> he's in that upper tier of quarterbacks when he's hot. But he can sink to, as we've seen also in the past, very, very low. But I thought he had a tremendous game last week. And, you know, where uh, I think, uh, you know, the Jacksonville quarterback kind of took a little shot at him before the game when they were talking beards and mustaches. And he, he basically said he was really, really old. And I think Fitzy took that to heart, you know, and uh, he came out, played a great game, and then mentioned it afterwards when, in his interview. So I thought it was a really good football game. I thought that Miami came out of that with a lot of positives. I thought they played really, really well. and. Um, you know, I think that's a team that's trending in the right direction. I really do. I like the moves they've made, and I think they're going to be getting better as we go along. I think so, too. Jacksonville's still trying to figure themselves out. They're one of the youngest teams in the National Football League. So, again, this is a year where we talked about people being on the hot seat. Dave Colwell and Doug Marone certainly are going to be heavily scrutinized, you know, whether it's fair to let them go after this year during a rebuild or not. Shad Khan's a very patient owner. Time will we'll see what happens. I will say, though, uh, that on a baseball note, I'm really happy with the, what the Miami Marlins are doing, aren't they? They beat the Chicago Cubs at a 5-1. to one. I hope that Starling Marte's not hurt. I know that he injured his pinky finger being hit by a pitch with it. You want to talk about a team with a lot of resiliency. The, Don Manningly is one of the best managers I've ever I, I can only imagine that he deserves my vote for manager of the year. What they've done using 61 players this year with about 174 roster moves to be able to make it to the playoffs of so the 31 and 29 mark in an abbreviated season to me. Uh, I, you know what? I don't really get sentimental rooting for a lot of teams. I try to be as objective as I can, but I'll tell you, being around the Miami Marlins situation, I can only hope and pray and root for the Marlins as hard as I can because they've been a very great inspirational story in the sports world, knowing what they've overcome despite all the corona. When you think about all the things that they had to do during their issues about players throwing balls into mattresses and staying warmed up and the resiliency on this team is me to me like nothing I've ever seen in my years of covering sports. So kudos to the Marlins. I hope we can keep it going. You know, and of course, congratulations to the Tampa Bay Lightning. And we'll see what happens with the Miami Heat against the Lakers. That figures to be a really good series as LeBron James attempts to de defeat the team that he led to a championship. And Jimmy Butler, to me, is one of the most underrated players on the planet. So anything you want to close out here on the broadcast, Steve? No, and I just wanted to say I thank you once again. It's always a pleasure doing this. I, I look forward to it all week. And you know, when I'm watching the games on Sunday, I'm already making notes on, you know, this will probably be a talking point for us uh, when we do the podcast. Because, you know, when I when I do a Patriots podcast, it usually I'm only looking at the game that they just played and then I'm looking ahead, you know, uh, at the next one. We don't get into a lot of other NFL news on those. So I look forward to these because we can talk about the league overall. 
I don't put any time limit on ice, you and I. But, you know, I may be too old school for my own good sake, so bear with me on this, Steve. I don't look at these as podcasts. I look at them at it as broadcasts. Come on, man. <laughs> I'm a 70s and 80s guy. I understand the word podcast as they come in, but I refuse to get used to that word. I am a broadcaster, and I always have been. I will be in heaven or wherever the man upstairs takes me, although he has to take me somewhere up at Wisconsin Memorial Gardens because I'll put me in one of them mausoleum things, museum, whatever the heck you call those things. <laughs> uh, so I'll be the one. They'll bury me with a microphone in my cat Maverick, and I'll still be rambling off one-liners to those people upstairs willing to listen, although we'll try to put it off for quite a while, but at any rate. So we're at the point of the broadcast, Steve Ballesteri, that you're going to give everybody a lot of details about how they're going to get a hold of you in every way, shape, or form, from Twitter all the way to whatever. Take it away. <laughs> all right. Again, you can follow me on Twitter at SteveB7SFG. Uh, I write for PatsFans.com. I also write for SoftRep Radio and SoftRep.com. I do podcasts for each of those, one called Patriots 4th and 2, SoftRep Radio. Um, I also do another podcast, uh, One Patriot Place. I, my buddy Thomas Murphy was listening to our uh, show here last week, and he said, you didn't mention the One Patriot Place, and I do that with him. Um, and, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to this week. I'm uh, looking at some history stuff I'm doing on the military side of the house. And I'm looking for some great football this weekend. You know, uh, the Patriots are playing the Chiefs, who look really, really strong right now. So I'm really intrigued to see if they can slow them down just the least little bit enough to make it a football game. Well, you tell me, okay, that if he wants to join this party on Wednesday night, He's got an invitation from me, and you will we'll bring him in here. I'm doing this broadcast. I got to tell you something pretty cool on Tuesday night. I have Ron Renzi, one of my attorneys, and another uh, guy, Joe Lippman, from the Coral Springs Chamber of Commerce. We do one on Tuesday nights. We'll bring anybody into our party if they want to shoot the breeze and have some fun. You tell Mr. Murphy that anytime he wants to come on this broadcast, that uh, he definitely has an open invitation with me. And if he wants to share this broadcast, we're not going to say no to it either. But, uh, but well, tell Mr. Murphy as an invitation. I look forward to doing it every week with you, Steve. I really, really do. And I'm glad that I keep you thinking. Of course, what would be a normal night be without giving you a couple of homework assignments? So make sure you go <laughs> out there and check on Gus the, the Mule and the other homework assignment that I gave you. But that said, okay, folks, you want to follow uh, us here, the audio side, you can do so with Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And I have to use the word because that's what they that's what we're supposed to do. I mean, I gotta like it, but I'm doing it. <laughs> too fast, like everybody seems to think I do. Anyways, I'll give you an audio replay. Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. In terms of following us on social media, easy. Twitter at Tribune South. After all, that's where I met Steve Ballesteri. He followed me. I followed back. He got more than he bargained for with that follow. <laughs> and, I, and I'm glad that he's able to utilize that Twitter account to get all the information I'm feeding him so we can make him smarter on these broadcasts and with whatever stuff he does. With that said, give you a repeat on the Twitter. At Tribune South gets it done. Facebook and Instagram, South Florida Tribune. That gets it done. Otherwise known with the three in a row, we call it a hockey hat trick, but we'll call it a social media hat trick. If that isn't good enough, you can uh, follow, subscribe to our YouTube channel for free, South Florida Tribune. And then our website is www.southfloridatribune.com. You'll find all of our content on there, both through our media distribution partners, our columnists, as well as our broadcasts. And we also have a section on there for uh, Motor City Monitor, where I like to go ahead and keep tabs on my hometown teams as well. So for all you Detroiters out there in Michigan Transplants, you're, we're your source for Motor City information. You can email us at southfloridatribune at gmail.com. And you can also connect with me on LinkedIn, Scott Morganroth. No, I don't have the Motor City Madmouth on that. I don't think that LinkedIn would frown upon that. But you can find Motor City Madmouth practically anywhere. Although I don't think they like it on Twitter. But Facebook is nice about it. So any thoughts there, Steve? Yeah, um, I'm also on Instagram, although I never use it. Uh, my boss uh, for the military side of the house is always after me to – Post my stories on Instagram. I, I don't really use it. I, there's more pictures of my dog, my bulldog on uh, my Instagram account than, than my uh, links to stories on there. But I guess 
that's something I need to start doing more of. Well, I'll have to do it. I'll have to do, figure out how to screenshot this stuff on Instagram. So I don't know. I'm definitely a WIP on Instagram work in progress. Okay. So for all you people that are looking for WIP work in progress or uh, G, uh, MTA, great minds think alike. There you go. So those <laughs> are uh, little nuggets for the night along with, so on behalf of Steve Ballesteri, my name is Scott Morgan, Roth the Motor City Madmouth. And, and our special guest tonight is Gus, the kicking mule. Uh, look forward to having you joining us on the next edition of the Sports Exchange. So have a great football week, and we'll make sure we bombard you with a lot of entertainment and good news for next week. Enjoy your football week, everybody. I'm Scott Morgan, Roth the Motor City Madmouth, and Steve, my KG veteran, good friend from the New England area, transplanted in New York. We'll catch you over at Culver's, eating the cheese curds, at a date to be determined. Good night, Steve. We'll catch you next week here from the Sports Exchange. And everybody out there, mask up, be safe. Don't take this COVID-19 seriously or you'll be in deep trouble. Good night, everybody.